Hello, everybody. Today we have with us the lead author of the ebook Quantum Entanglement Engineering and Application, Dr. F.J. Duarte. Thank you for joining us and welcome, Dr. Duarte. F.J. Duarte graduated with first class honors in physics from Manquire University in Sydney, Australia. He received his PhD in physics from the same university for his work on narrow line width tunable lasers. His research on lasers and optical physics has been widely applied in numerous fields from astronomy to nanophotonics. Dr. Duarte has practiced physics in the academic, industrial and defense sectors. He is also the author of numerous scientific papers, patents and some 15 laser optics and quantum optics books. His book titles are held at over 5,000 libraries worldwide. He's a fellow of the Australian Institute of Physics and the Optical Society of America, and he has received the Engineering Excellence Award and the David Richardson Medal from the Optical Society. Dr. Duarte, how is quantum entanglement, engineering and applications different from other books on quantum mechanics? Um, thank you, uh, Asara, for uh, uh, the question. Um, uh, First of all, I would like to um, uh, say that uh, a lot of the ideas that we include in the um, uh, new book, um, Quantum Entanglement Engineering and Applications, um, are um, extended uh, ideas that were first published in uh, quantum optics for engineers in 2014, and more recently in quantum um, fundamentals of quantum entanglement. And also, before I continue, um, I would like to thank my co-author, uh, Dr. Tyler. Quantum entanglement um, engineering um, and uh, applications um it's um a rather uh unique book uh that differs from most books on quantum um mechanics in that it is entirely uh focused on quantum entanglement um also uh it is self-contained and it is based on the um Dirac bracket notation that is the main tool used uniformly uh, throughout uh, the book. Also, it does not uh, require uh, treatment of sophisticated mathematical techniques. So uh, in that regard, is quite um, a different, um, unique book based more on the physics than um, on fancy mathematical techniques. Thank you. Quantum entanglement, engineering and applications emphasize a matrix approach to quantum entanglement. What are the advantages of this approach? Yes, uh, the, the, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the beauty of the matrix approach is that the probability amplitude of quantum entanglement, which is the basis for the whole field of quantum entanglement, um, is expressed in matrix notation. And that is compatible um, with the uh, matrix notation used to represent um, uh, crucial and important uh, optical elements uh, used in the lab optical elements such as beam splitters, um, polarization rotators, and interferometers. Quantum entanglement engineering and applications appears to be a very technical book. What is the mathematical background the reader needs to tackle successfully, the physics included? Uh, that's another um, very uh, striking feature of, of this book. Um, it's entirely based on, mostly on matrix mechanics, um, which most 
students um, would have encountered in first year um, algebra uh, and first year calculus. That is to say, um, the emphasis is on the physics, the mathematics is quite um, a practical, uh, pragmatic mathematics. And if the student uh, has um, uh, been given a, um, a good background on, on, on first year algebra and first year calculus, he or she will have uh, no difficulties in understanding the uh, mechanics of uh, quantum uh, entanglement engineering and applications. Quantum entanglement engineering and applications includes problems in every chapter. What is the level of mathematical sophistication needed to solve these problems? Um, again, uh, it is um, <clears throat> all based on, um, most of it is based on, uh, on matrix um, uh, mechanics and all problems given. It's about, uh, on average, about seven problems per chapter. Um, all problems are predicated on the material presented in the chapter. So the student doesn't need any further um, or additional uh, instructions or techniques to solve those problems. If he or she is familiar with um, handling matrices and reads carefully the material included in the chapter, uh, he or she will be able to solve all the problems. There appear to be two avenues to approach quantum entanglement. One is philosophical and the other one is physical. Any comments on that? Yes, um, and, and this is um, uh, a rather um, uh, important question. Uh, most uh, people, uh, I would say most practitioners in the field, are familiar with the philosophical approach uh, because that was the approach introduced by um, uh, Einstein, Polosky and Rosen in the famous uh, EPR paper, which then became known as the EPR paradox. That's one of the most cited papers in physics. And at the same time, there was an interaction between Einstein and Schrodinger. Um, Einstein um, uh, concluded um, and his co-authors that there would be a better, there could be a better representation of uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, many um, people, many authors um, focus on so-called hidden variable theories. And um, uh, that's how the subject evolved. Um, uh, people trying to uh, do experiments um, to prove hidden variable uh, theories. Uh, now, completely independent of that, uh, in a parallel track in 1930, uh, Dirac had introduced uh, a so-called uh, pair theory. And in 1946, uh, Wheeler uh, provided a beautiful uh, statement of what quantum, uh, quantum entanglement is based on the pair theory. And in that statement, Wheeler said, if you measure the polarization of one quantum in one direction, then the polarization of the other quantum will be orthogonal. Um, that was 1946. And in 1947, uh, Price and Ward uh, developed the um, mathematics um, the, to, to put that statement into uh, physics and a mathematical language, and also provided the first diagram of what a quantum entanglement um, experiment is. This is not very well known, and these two approaches, the philosophical and the physical approaches, kind of develop um, independent of each other. And it was uh, Bohn who first used the measurement of uh, Wu at all, uh, who was um, based on um, 
the Wu experiment was based on the calculations of John Ward and um, a Morris Price, and it was um, kind of in the 1950s that there was um, um, a mention in the philosophical side of things of the physics of quantum entanglement. Um, but for some mysterious reasons, um, uh, the equation for the probability amplitude of quantum entanglement, also known as Bell states, which was developed by Price and Ward, um, was brought in into the field almost in a ad hoc manner, um, uh, without explaining where it came from. What is the origin of quantum entanglement as we know it today? Well, uh, as we know it today, um, even though there is uh, a lot of um, <clears throat> talk about the EPR paradox and, and Bell theorem, uh, the essence of quantum of, of the quantum entanglement field as we know it today is based on the probability amplitude of quantum entanglement as developed uh, by Price and Ward and kind of presented um, a little bit out of the blue by um, Richard Feynman in the 19, in 1965. And I think it is that uh, form of the equation um, presented by Richard Feynman, which is a descendant of the price and war equation that people began to use without mentioning uh, where it came from. So in essence, the, the answer to this question is the probability amplitude of quantum entanglement. Any comments about the Bell's theorem? Um, Bell theorems is is a uh, is an important uh, development, mainly for historical reasons. Uh, already in 1932, uh, John uh, von Neumann had stated quite clearly that um, it was not possible to derive the postulates of or predictions of quantum mechanics from a hidden variable theory, but, but his argument was kind of um, uh, difficult or obscure, and it, it was uh, John Bell in 1964, that is uh, 32 years later, that provided uh, a clear and transparent exposition of why hidden variable theories could not reproduce the um, results of quantum mechanics. And so that was very important because um, a big section of the, of the community that came from the philosophical side and who were doing experiments on hidden variable uh, theories accepted that, that hidden variable theories um, were incompatible uh, with quantum mechanics. Do you have any comments about the EPR paradox? Yes, the EPR paradox, the einstein polozky and Rosen paradox, um, was, um, I guess, what stimulated Born um, with his arguments and, uh, in essence, later on, um, uh, Bell. So, historically, it's quite important. Um, but, um, has been uh, superseded um, by, by the physics side of the argument. The EPR paradox uh, essentially uh, said that uh, quantum mechanics was an incomplete theory. And in essence, um, it, it's, it, it kind of um, misses the uh, importance of the um, uncertainty principle. Already um, uh, in 1947, Dirac said that one could not make um, uh, exact uh, measurements of uh, position and momentum. And if the, the whole EPR paradox is predicated on the premise uh, that if we determine uh, momentum um, precisely, then the position it has an all-value spread. 
physically that is not um, uh, possible. Um, so it is the uncertainty principle that, as Richard Feynman said, protects uh, quantum uh, mechanics. This um, um, was uh, presented um, in, in 2014 in the book Quantum Optics for Engineers, and it's again uh, revisited in quantum uh, entanglement engineering and applications. Please tell us about the photon and non-locality. This is rather crucial. Um, uh, the photon, um, as um, uh, Willis Lamb said, um, is is not um, cannot be localized in any meaningful way, and that is known to all experimentalists who have done, for instance, um, a line width measurement of a very narrow line with laser using a max sender interferometer, which means if if the the line width of the of the laser is very narrow, uh, then uh, you will need a very large interferometer. It means that photon or that population of indistinguishable photons can be all over the um, the interferometer. Uh, that is the most striking and beautiful uh, immediate um, um, proof that the photon is non-local and as such uh, cannot be thought of, of as a particle. What do you mean for a pragmatic approach to interpretation in quantum mechanics? Yes, pragmatism. Um, physics uh, is pragmatic and it needs to be pragmatic because it needs to reflect nature. And the, the, as, as, as um, experimental science um, improves, we get better measurements, we understand nature better, and then the physics, uh, the theory has to reflect those improvements. Um, the the pragmat pragmatism um, is important in quantum mechanics um, uh, because it allows us to move forward, to make progress. There are many alternative um, uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics which, uh, which, which, which wade into philosophy uh, that are difficult to understand um, they use uh, sophisticated and obscure language. Uh, the, the principles of quantum mechanics, as stated by Feynman, are rather um, beautiful uh, mathematical statements. And uh, as Feynman himself said uh, in relation to quantum entanglement, there are no paradoxes. Uh, there appears only to be um, mis misunderstandings. If one um, um, considers uh, the um, the mathematical principles of of quantum um, mechanics. Um, um, about twelve of those are listed in chapter ten of the book. Um, then one can uh, deal with all the physics and the measurements um, of uh, quantum entanglement uh, without having uh, to be tormented by uh, misunderstandings and paradoxes. Quantum entanglement engineering and applications also emphasize quantum interference as a very fundamental phenomenon. What is more fundamental, quantum entanglement or quantum interference? That, that is a beautiful open question. Um, uh, John Ward um, thought that quantum entanglement uh, that the probability amplitude of quantum entanglement was all we need to know to understand uh, quantum mechanics, that that was the essence of quantum mechanics and that the rest were just mathematical techniques as uh, taught in books. On the other hand, Feynman um, uh, thought that um, uh, it, it is quantum interference uh, that is at the heart of quantum mechanics. And the, the answer is, 
is more perhaps interesting. Uh, quantum entanglement and quantum interference are linked at a very fundamental level. And if uh, someone could um, differentiate um, which of these two principles are more fundamental, uh, that would be a very nice development. Although I suspect at this stage um, that both principles are essential and both principles um, uh, share um, uh, the arena of fundamentalism in quantum mechanics. Uh, a very um, interesting and important uh, addition is that the equation for the probability of amplitude of quantum entanglement can um, be derived uh, in a very transparent manner from the uh, physics of uh, interference, that is, uh, considering an n-slit um, interferometer. Uh, that was done uh, by myself um, in a paper published in 19 in 2013 and is also uh, explained in detail in the book. Um, the, um, the equations in quantum mechanics are uh, reversible. One can go from, let's say, the equation um, of um, the interferometric principle, that is the Dirac Feynman interferometric principle, to uh, the probability of quantum uh, entanglement um, and vice versa. Uh, now, the the one uh, interesting detail here is that in order to uh, go from quantum entanglement uh, to um, to interference, um, uh, the initial uh, steps. Uh, to get to the equation of of the of quantum entanglement independently requires some additional mathematics. This may indicate slightly that uh, perhaps uh, interference uh, may be more fundamental than quantum entanglement, but uh, this uh, needs to be uh, studied further. In your opinion, what is the most striking, the most awesome aspect of quantum entanglement? Well, it's the, I think, the, the non-locality of the photon. Uh, in other words, almost this omnipresence of the photon that can be beautifully expressed in the probability amplitude um, um, equation. Uh, it can be expressed rather elegantly and the implications of that are enormous. Any final comment about the interplay between philosophy and quantum mechanics? Yes, um, <clears throat> there is um, um, uh, a school of thought in, in present-day uh, physics uh, that we need to uh, interact uh, with uh, philosophers. Um, on the other hand, Einstein, um, um, Feynman uh, uh, didn't care much for philosophy, and I kind of tend to agree with him. All the important developments in physics have been done by physicists. Um, uh, philosophy is fun, um, but uh, for what I read, um, it, it tend to muddy the picture. Um, uh, the, the, um, essential, the essentials also always remain in the, in the physics side of things, uh, because physics as I said before, is pragmatic. It it depends to uh, it, it it reflects the, the nature. And on the other hand, a lot of philosophy comes with 
cultural biases which are not uh, always useful. So, so my um, uh, position in this regard is to uh, second uh, the statements of Richard Feynman. Thank you so much for your time today with us, Dr. Tuarte. Thank you.